smashed it. We have a lot of work to do and we should be prepared to have some social distancing either at the individual or the government level for the foreseeable future until we have a vaccine. I do wanna talk about some of these trends and these are from yesterday. Um, normally I get an update between 2.30 and three every day. So in Wisconsin, we've pushed the doubling time out from about three days on March 12th out to almost two weeks and that's really great progress. And I wanna thank everybody for their diligent work. The daily growth rates, which started out at about 35% on March 12th, have now been suppressed down to below 5%, so 4.5% yesterday. Again, good progress. On the other hand, we did have 330 positive tests in Wisconsin yesterday and 335 today. And the percentage of positive tests was 8.6% yesterday and 8% today, according to Wisconsin DHS. Now our testing capacity has increased significantly over the past few weeks and bumped up again today to 14,800. So that also is great progress. Our intensive care unit and ventilator capacity is stable and adequate in Wisconsin. And I wanna stress that we have never exceeded the ability of our health systems in Wisconsin to render the best care to the sickest patients using non-crisis standard care. Now our personal protective equipment um, trends are improving or stable, but I wanna make sure everyone understands that PPE continues to be a limiting factor, both in our ability to render good care to COVID-19 patients and for our health systems to be able to confidently reopen for business as usual. And that's gonna be a continuing problem for us for at least the next year. If we could go to the next slide, please. This slide shows the daily numbers of new COVID-19 positive cases in Wisconsin since March 12th. And as you can see, there appeared to be a leveling off in mid-March, but the cases began to increase two weeks ago, largely coinciding with a very significant increase in our testing capacity, but also with new outbreaks in food processing plants, primarily in Brown County, but also in Milwaukee County, and of course in nursing homes. And this is important because we need to monitor this standard because it's one of the gating metrics in the Badger Bounce Back plan. Next slide, please. This slide also shows, as of yesterday, the statewide capacity to test for COVID-19 infections as shown by the blue line. And that has significantly increased over the last three weeks and in fact bumped up significantly again today from 11,400 uh, to uh, significantly higher than that. So this is approaching our goal of about 85,000 tests per week. Now to be clear, this test that we're monitoring is the diagnostic test that measures RNA from COVID-19 using the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. We're not talking about serological or antibody tests. Now that's important because I believe these are going to come online in the near future and might help us have a better understanding of the number of people in our communities who've had COVID-19 and may have developed an immune reaction to COVID-19. So that's gonna be a significant improvement over the next month or so. Next slide, please. And as I've said, it appears that we've reached an equilibrium with COVID-19 in Wisconsin. Now locally, I think we've done a very good job. Inarguably, Wisconsin has had among the very best results in the Midwest, especially when we compare our progress to Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, and Iowa. And I believe that Safer at Home has worked and that our citizens and employers have been very well focused on health and safety. But I wanna stress that we're not done with COVID-19. Because I said early on, we flattened the curve, but we haven't crushed it. We need to maintain vigilance, especially as we begin to anticipate hopefully a phased and careful reopening of our economy. And as we do that, we're gonna to need to carefully monitor hospital capacity, ICU bed capacity, and personal protective equipment. We're all going to need to encourage personal and workplace health and safety best practices. We're going to need to, need to focus on protecting vulnerable populations. Those would be uh, people of color and people in institutionalized settings such as nursing homes. We're also going to need to help our public health officials work on testing, contact tracing, and isolation of positive or suspected positive individuals. We also need to think about mitigation strategies for flare-ups and secondary waves that may occur in our state or in our own communities. 
we're going to need to work very hard on employee and consumer education as we think about reopening sectors of the economy. And then all of us are going to need to get used to living responsibly in a world with risk. Next slide, please. And on this slide, I'd like to highlight some of the recent efforts to protect vulnerable populations in Wisconsin. And again, I'm not sure that we could have done better as a state, but I wish that we'd had the foresight to intervene more quickly in a culturally relevant way in African American, Latino, and Native American communities, and to have focused a little bit earlier on mitigation and long-term care facilities and food processing plants. And in that regard, last week, Governor Evers announced that the state plans to administer weekly COVID-19 diagnostic tests to about 10,000 long-term care facility employees and residents in nearly 400 nursing homes. And we're also going to increase National Guard unit deployment from 10 to 25 to help to test workers and families associated with outbreaks in business settings. And I believe that we're gonna increase free drive-through testing sites in communities across the state, especially vulnerable communities. But going forward, we all need to keep our focus on minority communities who've been disproportionately impacted by the health and economic challenges of COVID-19, and in particular, African-American, Latino, Hmong, and Native American communities. Those are particularly vulnerable. Next slide, please. And on this final slide, I'd like to focus on the concept of workplace health and safety principles. We all need to prepare and protect employees and visitors customers and communities and facilities, the places and spaces in which we conduct business. Now, this framework was created by Dr. Laura Cassidy at the Medical College of Wisconsin Institute for Health and Equity in collaboration with the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce that incorporates best practices from CDC, World Health Organization, and OSHA. And it's really centered around continued social distancing hygiene, and sanitization practices. And we believe that this framework can facilitate cross-sector collaboration to benefit all of us in Wisconsin. And it highlights our shared responsibility for doing all that we can to protect the safety and health of our people while we responsibly reopen the, the economy. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Tom and Michelle. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Dr. Fauci. Again, appreciate your time. Uh, we do have some questions that have been submitted, uh, but before we go to those, if there are any questions from the floor that any of the um, of any of our participants would like to ask, Tom, we do have a call. We do have a question here from uh, Ashland County Administrator Clark Schrader for Dr. Raymond. What do you think about regional openings here in Ashland County? We are very different from Milwaukee regarding risk, density, and cases. Do you think we should wait till Milwaukee is safe to open for Northwest Wisconsin to open? Do you consider us to be the same risk given these factors? Yeah, really excellent questions. I don't think there's a right answer here. Let me first start by saying that in the ideal world, we would have a national policy or at least a multi-state policy in, in the Midwest where we could coordinate the timing and the types of closures and reopening the economy that we have. Um, but recognizing that we don't have that and that people can travel freely, I do understand that each county may have different needs in a different situation, but let's make sure that we know there are no boundaries for the spread of this disease. All it takes is one person to go into your county, to go into a grocery store, a restaurant, a barber, barber shop, to silently spread this stealthy and potentially lethal disease into your community. So there really is no right answer. Um, I'm not opposed to regionalization, but what I would say is if we're going to do that, we need to have a robust infrastructure for public health, and we need to have mitigation plans where we can rapidly intervene if there's a surge or spike like we saw in Brown County, which I would remind everybody, a month ago had virtually no cases, mm -hmm. and now is probably the epicenter of, of, of COVID-19 in our state. Our next question, doctor, is from R. Scholz. Why is there such a big gap between test utilized and test capacity? Yeah, that is really an outstanding question. I think there are a couple of reasons for it. Um, first of all, we don't right now have a coordinated statewide deployment of our testing capacity. It's largely split up between commercial laboratories, laboratories associated with large health systems, local municipalities, and the state. So I think we could have better coordination. 
we're also at kind of an awkward position right now. We have enough tests to cover frontline healthcare providers and people who have symptoms that present to many of our health systems, but there's some geographic disparities. Most of the testing capacity is in Milwaukee and Madison. We don't have enough testing capacity to provide um, at, uh, at your convenience testing for anybody that feels like they wanna have a COVID-19 diagnostic test. So we would probably need to have three or four times our capacity right now to really take that next step. So we're in an awkward spot right now. Doctor, another question that we have here is, what are your thoughts on the predicted second wave of COVID-19 um, early fall into the winter? And is there any way we can mitigate this? Well, until we have a vaccine, the only way to mitigate second waves, whether they come in the fall or they're associated with relaxation of the safer at home order, would be to continue individual uh, personal social distancing practices and to encourage that in the workplace and in places of commerce. And I know that that may depend in large part on personal choices, but I certainly see a lot of fatigue, especially with the nice weather that we had, the religious holidays a couple weeks ago. It was pretty clear that people weren't necessarily exercising the same level of diligence that they were before. And what I could stress is really our only tool right now is social distancing. We don't have a vaccine. And even though remdesivir, um, has some promise as an effective therapy for people that are critically ill with COVID-19. It's not a magic bullet and it's not something that we can use for prevention. So Dr. Raymond, another question here is, do you think, much like what you were just talking about, but do you think it's going to be safe for schools and for universities to go back into session in some way um, in person this fall? Yeah, there's no good answer to that. I know that a number of universities are are planning to have students come back, um, and that's probably reasonable, but they're gonna need to have uh, both financial and operational plans in case there's a spike at, the, at their university. And by financial, I mean they're gonna need to be prepared to give refunds to students for dormitories and cafeteria. And uh, again, until we have good testing capacity, and we're sure that the presence of antibodies means that you have some level of immunity, people are really kind of rolling the dice. Now, in terms of younger children, K through 12, um, even though children are not immune to, to getting COVID-19, and some of them can have pretty severe side effects, that's a pretty small percentage. And I would say that uh, many people would suggest that it would be okay to open K through 12. The real problem there is whether the kids could bring home COVID-19 to their parents or grandparents. And there's really no good answer to that. Another question here from Mark Roloff. What type of testing do you suggest for congregate facilities such as homeless shelters? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think right now diagnostic testing or that PCR test for the viral RNA is probably the best test that we can do to screen for active infections. The problem with those tests are that they're not 100% sensitive or 100% specific. They're getting better. Um, especially at, at labs like the one that we have at Freighter in the Wisconsin Diagnostic Lab that do a very high volume of testing and they have sophisticated equipment. But I would start there. As we get further into the pandemic and we're sure that the presence of antibodies might confer some immunity, then we might switch to the serologic tests or the tests that measure antibodies. We have a question here from Nicholas Trimmer in Price County. Can you discuss the use of masks? We are seeing very little use in rural Wisconsin. Right. Um, thanks, Nicholas. I, I think cloth face coverings are probably the, the types of coverings that you're talking about for use in grocery stores and when people are out of their, their home environments. Um, it basically confers protection for, for you to prevent spreading to other individuals. It's not perfect. It's not as good as an N95 mask or a surgical mask. The reason to wear, um, I think, a face covering really in part is to show solidarity and that you're understanding the, the need for social distancing. Again, what I would say is rural communities are not immune to the spread of COVID-19. We're seeing that in South Dakota and Iowa and Wyoming and rural settings where um, they're actually having some very significant surges. And the problem in some cases is that um, large 
tertiary care centers aren't close by. And so if somebody gets COVID-19 and they're very ill, they're gonna to have to leave their home counties to get good care. Great, I think we have time for one more question here from Lolita Olson. I know we're ramping up with testing of symptomatic residents here in Northwest Wisconsin, but are there plans to start testing asymptomatic people? Um, I don't know if there are plans in specific regions of the state, but we're starting to roll plans out here in Milwaukee. And what I would say is, especially for serological testing, so that we can understand how many people in our communities have actually been exposed, so that can inform good policy, we really need to roll those tests out across the whole state. Great. Dr. Raymond, we do have time, hopefully, for one more question from Steve Volkert. In regards to testing, would someone on the front line need to be tested regularly versus someone not in healthcare facilities? If someone has no symptoms and isn't around those that may have it and doesn't have any hospital plans, do they really need to be tested? Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, first of all, for frontline healthcare providers, I think as we have more testing capacity, they really should be tested frequently. And I think you're seeing for some at-risk populations like employees and residents of long-term care facilities, Governor Evers announced a plan to test about 10,000 of those people every week with a diagnostic test. I think for asymptomatic individuals who've had no exposure right now, uh, probably no need to do the testing. But again, as we increase testing capacity in every corner of our state, it wouldn't be a bad idea to do frequent testing of people that have had some level of exposure. All right, I said that was the last question, but we have one final one that came in. If we could get you to answer, this would be great. Uh, this is from John Staluski, and John, I apologize. You're, you're from the village of, and it says dot, dot, dot. Um, but the question is, Dr. Raymond, you specifically mentioned and showed the framework developed with the MMAC. Has mm -hmm. your group also evaluated the Badger bounce back plan, which is still evolving, and the WMC plan, which appears to be quite thorough in terms of gateways and health metrics? Um, yes, we have, and I, I think all of them have good aspects. Um, the Badger Bounce Back Plan, uh, what's good about it is there are publicly available data that feed metrics that are either gating or dialing criteria for opening the economy, and there's a phased and responsible reopening of the economy. Um, you could argue about whether the metrics are the correct ones, and I do applaud Governor Evers and Secretary Palm for working with the Wisconsin Hospital Association to create metrics that they thought were reasonable, and those were just released yesterday. Um, in terms of the WMC plan, incredibly thoughtful, very useful tool um, that uses publicly available data. Um, I uh, wanna say that I, I really respect a lot of the work that's been done there, but it is not a full plan. In my opinion, it is a tool for responsibly reporting risk levels that are geographically um, ca calibrated for the level of risk. In my opinion, that's a social responsibility tool for employers. But what I would say is it really doesn't touch on the availability of public health capacity testing, and there's no mitigation plan. So um, again, lots of lots to like about the tool, but I don't consider it to be a full plan. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. And just to clarify, that was from John Staluski, who's with the Village of West Milwaukee. Okay, um, Tom, you. I'm going to hand it back over to you. Dr. Raymond, great to see you again. Okay, thanks great, so thanks much. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Dr. Raymond. Appreciate it very much and hopefully have you back um, again at least one more time or possibly a couple more times too, depending on the pandemic. So given that, hopefully not as many times given everything's going on, but really appreciate your statewide perspective um, and your answers to, to a number of questions. And thanks also to the group uh, for some really good questions and some good discussion. So now we shift gears a little bit, but still quite topical to the overall issue of the pandemic. And that is specifically how things have affected the tourism industry. And this is tourism week. So I think it's kind of timely to talk about that. And usually when we think of um, tourism, we're thinking about a couple of select parts around the state, uh, Dells, Northwoods, Door County, but really this is something that affects all of us. In my county, Adegami County, you probably don't think about Adegami County as a tourist destination. I mean, it's not just because I live here though, but we're actually one, one of the top 10. And the reason why we're one of the top 10 is because we have the Fox River Mall and that of course, like all malls, is shut down. So I think that this is timely to have the secretary here. I think I think it's a good complement to the health questions, the political questions, on um, the economic questions to give us some sense of that. So this is clearly something that affects 
most, if not all, the counties. So with that, uh, Madam Secretary, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me today. Um, I'm honored to uh, be able to talk to everyone on the call today uh, and share hopefully what will end up feeling like a sandwich of good news with a little bit of bad in the middle and then sandwiched on the other side with some good news. So um, in tourism, we at least like to end on a positive note. So first I'm gonna start with letting everyone know um, kind of where we sit and, and you know, to the point, um, uh, Tom shared that it is National Travel and Tourism Week. And, and while it doesn't feel like it uh, for frankly any of us, it really comes down to the one week a year that the entire tourism industry actually um, um, in a coordinated way talks about the role that tourism plays in our economies. Uh, and without question, not a giddy count, out of Gamey County, um, tourism plays a significant role, and a significant role in the state overall in, in the 10th position, as you mentioned. So what I'm going to start with is that good news. 2020 is not going to feel like 2019, because 2019 was our largest year for Wisconsin tourism on record. Uh, that's good news for a lot of reasons. This isn't a celebratory dance at an inappropriate time. It's actually a really important time for us to understand that the strength of the tourism economy for Wisconsin is actually gonna be a piece of our recovery and an important piece of our recovery on the other side of this. As soon as travel stopped, which as we saw in previous charts uh, with Dr. Raymond, right about the week of uh, March, ending March 15th, we saw travel completely come to a screeching halt. That means very few stays in hotels. That means people weren't eating out in restaurants anymore. That means people weren't traveling to and from uh, our state. People weren't traveling within our state. Um, and in that seven week period since then, Wisconsin has seen a loss in travel spending of nearly $1.3 billion to our state. In 2019, Tourism actually brought $22.2 billion of economic impact to the state and sustained over, a, over 202,000 jobs throughout the state. There is tourism in all 72 counties of our state. And many of those counties rely more heavily on tourism than others. In fact, some of the smallest communities couldn't possibly sustain the business and commerce needs with just their resident population. They rely very heavily on visitors uh, uh, to buoy their businesses and stay in their hotels and eat in their restaurants and buy their goods. So as travel stopped, so did revenue going into those communities, but also so stopped tax revenue coming into the state and into those communities for future services. So as you can see, it's kind of a downward spiral. Um, and the problem of course is that until travel does resume, the continued loss, um, is going to be felt. So while that was good, good news that we had a really strong 2019, 2020's impact is something that we all need to kind of reckon with now. We've seen the, the tourism economy get hit very hard. So for those of you uh, who, who aren't directly involved in the either convention visitors bureaus or chambers of commerce, I know many of you are probably very familiar with this, most of those organizations are funded by room tax revenue. And when you don't have people staying in hotels and lodging, you don't have dollars coming in for room tax revenue. Those dollars are, are used for the operations of CVBs and chambers, but also for the promotion of the communities in which the businesses depend on visitation. So again, that compounds the problem. Not only do we need to be able to come out of this uh, by bringing people back to our communities when it is safe to do so and bring dollars into those businesses, but those dollars needed to do that are also gone. So how are we going to solve this? Well, one challenge to that situation was the federal stimulus package actually um, did not offer as much coverage for 501c6s, largely CVBs and chambers are 501c6s, of course. Um, they were not eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program, for example, um, and several other programs that were available to other businesses and other nonprofits, but not 501c6. So we have a bit of a gap there in the ability to actually help buoy the work of our chambers and CBBs. Uh, so we have a long way to go, and we're not going to be able to make whole 
these organizations, but we do need to come up with a plan to sustain the promotion of local and regional destinations in the context of telling the story of Wisconsin as a great destination. Um, so there, but there are a few reasons we should be optimistic and can be optimistic. There are some, there's data out there that is actually telling the story that Wisconsin may be better positioned than several other states, even in the Midwest, to, to be poised for a strong tourism recovery, again, when it is safe to resume travel. Um, I know Dr. Raymond touched on this earlier. Um, of course, it's one thing to open a business and to put in safeguards for workers and business owners and to begin having commerce, you know, um, op opening commerce back up. But people who are not confident that they can remain safe and healthy by visiting your business or by visiting your community are not going to show up. Opening a business and not having customers isn't a great equation. So we need to work in tandem with setting standards um, and guidance for reopening businesses, keeping workers safe, and also keeping those visitors and customers safe and confident that they can move about uh, freely and comfortably and not risk getting themselves sick or getting um, their loved ones sick. So that's why the communication of both the Badger Bounce Back, but also the subsequent industry reopening plans um, is an important piece of the process that the Department of Tourism is, is uh, participating in. We're working very closely with WEDC uh, and of course CHS to ensure that the recommended guidance documents are being made available as soon as possible so that businesses can make plans for when it's time to reopen and consistently offer the same safeguards throughout the state so that whether you're in Outagamie County or uh, Brown County, you know that the same standards are being held to you and that your safety can be consistently understood. And that's an important piece of the consumer confidence portion that tourism is very reliant upon. Uh, we sell experiences, we sell vacation, but what we ultimately drive is economic recovery for the state. So we have to kind of think of those things in tandem when we think of reopening business and what it requires for those businesses to actually succeed throughout the state. Um, there's a lot of data available both through the U.S. Travel Association, which is the national association for um, basically the tourism entities um, that tells us that Wisconsin has a lot of things going for it when it comes to a tourism rebound. First and foremost, while about 50% of people who had plans to travel, this is a nationwide survey, survey while about 50% had plans to travel uh, and canceled those plans, of those still planning to travel in the next six months, I actually say they've shifted their trips from a place they were planning to fly to to a place they were planning to drive to. Now, what does that mean for Wisconsin? Well, it doesn't mean necessarily we're gonna, we're gonna reach the, the East Coast and West Coast. That hasn't been our target audience traditionally anyway. It means that what we have is a unique opportunity in our surrounding states to appeal to driving markets to, to think of Wisconsin as a great destination. The good news with that, too, is that that has been traditionally the base of our target audience. And one of the driving forces of people wanting to come to the state of Wisconsin also happens to be a pretty social distancing friendly category of activity, and that is outdoor recreation. Outdoor recreation has actually been a leading motivator for visitors to the state of Wisconsin for several years. Knowing what we have as a set of natural assets and destinations throughout our state and the communities that are the gateways to those natural assets are an important piece of the equation of how do we position ourselves for rebound? How do we stay relevant in the, in the minds of a consumer audience now with a new layer of risk and concern in their minds? And then how do we actually encourage people to come back when the time is right? So that national data paired with our own research uh, of consumer interest in the state of Wisconsin actually results in a well-timed uh, and, and well-positioned promotional campaign that we anticipate being able to start as soon as public health guidance tells us it's appropriate to do so. Um, that, that campaign you may notice is going to be quite different from what you may remember from last year. Some of you might remember a famous person on a parade float in a parade at a large festival in northern Wisconsin. 
clearly parades, festivals, and large crowds on streets in summer and fall of 2020 is not the storyline uh, that would be appropriate in a time of, of post-COVID-19 and still dealing with this. But it turns out that our research tells us that what people want from Wisconsin is actually a bit more on the natural outdoor recreation, person-to-person, -person, smaller group type experiences. It isn't that fairs and festivals are not relevant. It just is pretty timely to know that our research has shifted us in a direction of focusing on positioning the state as a place where people can come to refresh, see natural beauty, experience fresh experiences, local foods, local beverages, and really unique person-to-person -person experiences. So there are a lot of reasons for us to be optimistic, to, to take the opportunity when it is appropriate to do so, to encourage people in the driving regional market to consider Wisconsin um, as a destination of choice. Um, and ultimately, we know that because 2019 was the largest year for tourism on record, we know demand and interest and awareness is the highest it's ever been. So when we pair all these things together, despite this massive drop in, in revenue um, and being on the back foot when it comes to budgets to be able to remote, we're working very closely um, to support local and regional chambers and um, uh, CVBs in order to do the best we can to have a rising tide lift all boats. Uh, we know that tourism at $22.2 billion of economic impact in 2019 will not hit those same numbers in 2020, but we can push toward a recovery later um, in the summer season and consider fall and winter as recovery areas and times as well, and look forward to 2021 to also build upon that. So big picture, those are the things we are working on. That's the COVID sandwich that I was referring to at the beginning of, uh, of my, my uh, comments. Um, and I hope that information was helpful to you. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and I know that quite a few people are, um, communities are now transitioning. Um, I spoke with the Fox Cities Chamber this morning. They're making their, they are retooling, you know, Oktoberfest in, in, in the fall, and that brings in about 150 or 200,000 people. And if we were to soak to, uh, to uh, um, appropriately uh, social distance everyone, it would take us from here to St. Croix Falls. And so this is gonna be a challenge. It's gonna be a mm -hmm. challenge all over the state. Yep. We do have a few moments here, um, a few minutes for, for questions. Um, I'll open it to the floor and then I know that Michelle's got a few questions in the queue. Absolutely, hi Secretary Meany. Hi. Within, this is from Jason Hake, Lincoln County Administrative Coordinator. Within the Northern Rural Counties, there seems to be mixed feelings on when and how quickly to reopen. Many small businesses rely on tourism as their primary source of income. On the other hand, rural counties have seen less confirmed cases than urban areas, and some of the community worries about their health and safety during the tourism season. Tourism season is quickly approaching, which will result in many people from across the state and country visiting and the occurrences of large gatherings. What reopening measures will be taken to ensure tourism is maximized while ensuring the health and safety concerns of the local community? And will you be seeking input from those areas before decisions are made? That's a great question. And frankly, it's the one that keeps me open, open, awake. Well, I suppose my mind is open, awake uh, at night. It, it's, it's a catch-22, isn't it? It's a lot like what Dr. Raymond was talking about. There isn't actually an answer to that. Um, the, the, the tools that are available to us um, as, as leaders in tourism, but also as business owners, as customers, and as workers. The tools that are available to us to keep us and our families safe are limited. Social distancing, physical barriers, and staying home. That doesn't bode well for tourism when you think about some of the activities that you might traditionally associate with tourist activities, like fairs and festivals. Um, so large events are something that we're keeping a very close eye on and listening to public health guidance very closely. Um, uh, most and many events through summer are either being postponed or held for a decision, um, kind of a, a suspended decision or canceled or, or postponed altogether. Um, because that, that security of safety is pretty much impossible to ensure. Um, the activities that are 
uh, uh, available throughout the state of Wisconsin that can enable social distancing and personal health limitations um, you know, that, that we can actually maintain for ourselves and control do involve things like outdoor recreation and wide open spaces. That is a large part of what brings people into smaller communities. Um, and, and the things that are being advised by our public health officials are exactly the things available to us. Wearing masks and physical distance are the two most practical and pretty much the only two available when we think about what it looks like for businesses to reopen and for visitors to show up. I wish I had a better answer. So, Secretary Meany, when we discuss business tourism with conventions and conferences mm -hmm. that are held here in Wisconsin, how has that been immediately impacted? And mm -hmm. once we get out of crisis mode, how do you think this looks uh, moving forward for conventions that are sometimes booking out two, five, sometimes even 10 years in advance? Right, right. Well, um, so I know Destinations Wisconsin has shared uh, the results of, of a recent survey of their members, um, which gives us a snapshot of the type of, of budget reductions and actual you know, economic impact reductions they're anticipating seeing as a result of event cancellations and loss of room tax dollars. Um, the room tax dollar prediction uh, is upwards of $13 million. So think of that in terms of operating budget and promotional budget reduction. And that's only just a snapshot of, of a chunk of members, right? So um, it's, it's certainly, that's kind of the low end. But there are hundreds of events canceling, resulting in tens to hundreds of millions of dollars of economic impact being lost in those communities. Um, the, you know, it's, it's a bit like heads in beds. For every night you don't have someone staying in your hotel room, that is a night lost. We can't make up for this. And the lead time for many of these events um, is years. Um, and, and the same thing is true, unfortunately, across the entire country. Until businesses and individuals um, are in a position to know that their personal health and safety can be insured, we're going to see a loss in that space. And that is a huge driver of dollars uh, and commerce into our communities, even if you don't think of those things as tourism. Uh, so uh, the, the work we need to do is to continue to support those entities that seek and secure businesses, excuse me, events in the future, whether they are business conventions, trade shows, or things like tournaments um, or special events. Those activities, are going to be a part of our recovery in the future, but they're not going to be the first things to come back. Leisure travel is likely to be one of the first things that we will see come back. Um, our work one-to-one -to, -one to bring a leisure traveler into the state certainly takes more time and more dollars than 1,000 or 10,000 person um, events. It's, it's, um, it's a challenge that we're going to be building back from for a while. Great. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Very much appreciate your time. We do have to move to our next guest, but if there are any questions for the group, uh, please uh, submit them uh, uh, to uh, Michelle or myself. And if we can pass them along to you, uh, Madam Secretary, you can follow up directly with those local officials. We would be happy to. Thank you so much for the opportunity today. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bye. we are moving to um, a man that needs no introduction, a good friend of mine, longtime friend of mine from Western Wisconsin, who has been a tremendous uh, Wisconsin advocate. Uh, he sits on the powerful Ways and Means Committee, um, has been a member of the Congress for, I think, 20, 22 years. So he joined when he was about 24, 25 years old, something like that. But anyhow, uh, Congressman Kai, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Well, thank you, Tom. Thanks for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. I was a little bit older than that, not much, but, uh, and, and also I want to thank Anne-Marie and Michelle for helping to set up this meeting. And I appreciated the fact I was able to hop on and listen to Secretary Meany and the balancing that she and the Evers administration is trying to do right now as far as moving that dial in ways that keep people safe and healthy as we try to revive this economy that was, you know, that was put into a self-imposed coma. Uh, and that's painful and has consequences as well. But first, let me just thank you all uh, because you are literally where the rubber meets the road with our democracy. You've all been working incredibly hard to maintain essential services and programs for citizens across our state. That's more crucial now than ever. 
And there is certainly a recognition in Washington that state and local budgets have taken a hit, again, with the economic coma and the drop in revenues. And that's going to require some tough decisions on your part. But right now, in the midst of the most recent negotiation on the package that we're working on uh, in, respect, in, in response to this uh, global pandemic, uh, there's an effort to try to have the federal government act as a temporary backstop to state and local budgets so you can maintain those essential programs and services without drastic cuts or furloughs or layoffs uh, right now. That is yet to be decided. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll reach an agreement here shortly that we can move on uh, with. But in the meantime, uh, it's gonna be a tough call and we're gonna be relying on a lot of your guidance and advice on how we can do this, reopen the economy in a safe and healthy manner. It will be difficult to do it if customers, consumers go out there without great confidence that they and their loved one's health is gonna be protected in the midst of all this. Yet I certainly appreciate the mounting pressure that businesses are feeling uh, in regards to the drop in their revenue and their eagerness to start reviving things. Let's face it, springtime in Wisconsin is a tough place to be with the warmer weather, flowers breaking up, turkeys gobbling, people wanna start re-engaging again, I get that. But I also hope that our North Star will remain the best medical and scientific advice that's available and that we listen to those healthcare experts on what is the safe means of reopening things up again. Uh, clearly, there's gonna have to be protocols in place in businesses large and small for infectious disease control, a lot of disinfecting, a lot more testing, um, and quite frankly, Governor Evers' uh, Badger Bounce Back program is modeled very closely with what the federal task force recommended. 14 days of declining numbers with COVID cases uh, in our state, making sure we're developing a comprehensive testing regime. We're not there yet. Making sure we have much better contact tracing in order to identify hot spots and being able to contain and mitigate. We're not there yet making sure we're ramping up our antibody testing and even what that means to people who were exposed and developed antibodies. Are they safe now? We don't have those answers. And there's still some critical shortfalls with personal protection equipment that our healthcare workers uh, need. Uh, today is National Nurses uh, Day. And I was on the phone with many nurses throughout the state, thanking them for their service. But all of them were expressing continued concern about their vulnerability in the midst of all this, their hope that Wisconsinites will continue practicing sensible social distancing so that we don't have a flare up and we don't have a huge outbreak and then capacity overload with our healthcare providers, especially in rural areas throughout the state that don't have the capacity uh, to deal with huge numbers that might spike uh, if we let our guard down too carelessly or too soon. So these are some of the difficulties that we're wrestling with right now. But if there's ever a time for a strong federal, state, and local partnership, it's right now. There can be no light separating us. We're all in this together. We're gonna to have to be able to listen to each other, follow good advice, follow good protocols of care that are being implemented back home in our communities, and see if we can do this in a balanced and yet safe manner as we move forward. So again, Hopefully we're gonna have another package coming out of Washington here short, shortly. Hopefully from my perspective, there'll be some aid to state and local budgets that are being hit. Clearly there's gonna be more assistance to our healthcare providers. Um, also, we're monitoring very closely the Paycheck Protection Program. We've had two tranches now that have gone out. Hopefully that guidance is a lot clearer and that the process of applying and receiving funds is being expedited and much smoother. Uh, than the first go around, but we're gonna continue to track the data and the facts as they come in and determine additional help and assistance at the federal level uh, as we move forward. So Tom, let me just uh, stop right there and leave a few minutes at least for any feedback sure. or comments, questions that um, anyone might have. Sure, thanks again, Congressman. Really appreciate those remarks and also the time you set aside this afternoon to take a couple of questions. Before we go into it, I just wanted to know from your perspective, a nationwide vantage point, uh, how Wisconsin is measuring up, it's kind of a softball question, but perhaps some lessons learned as you talk to your colleagues, whether you know, in Washington State, New York, Florida, places that might have been hit harder and earlier, things that they have done that have worked or not worked. If you can share with the, us some of those lessons and practices. 
Yeah, one thing about a global pandemic is you can go to school on those areas that were hit first and hardest initially and learn from any mistakes they made or any best practices that they were able to adopt. We're doing that on a constant basis with China, with South Korea, with Singapore, with Germany right now, Italy starting to emerge, France even, uh, and collecting that data. But also, as you would expect, it's the more populated, densely populated areas that do get hit hardest when it comes to a virus of this nature and even a flu influenza. My concern always as a representative of a larger rural area in the state is typically it takes a little bit longer for the flu virus or any virus to show up in our rural communities. Mm -hmm. Milwaukee clearly was hit first, uh, some portions of Dane County uh, as well, but I'm afraid there might be the slow roll now uh, going out through the rest of the state. And again, if we're not careful, this can flare up in unimaginable ways that could overwhelm our healthcare systems. And then all the progress that we've made so far with proper social distancing, with all the public hygiene practices that have been pounded into our head for the last couple of months, we're just gonna get set right back. Mm -hmm. So my advice to Governor Evers was, uh, let's follow the medical advice. If you have to set expectations, set them a little bit lower rather than too high. Let's try to exceed them uh, and do it the Wisconsin way. But let's not also get careless, let our guard down, only to see a snapback and then having to shut down whole regions of the state or whole communities and deal with the psychological fallout from all of that. This is going to be hard. It's going to, there's no clear answer uh, to any of this. But based on what other regions of the country have experienced right now and the lessons that we are picking up with maintenance of social distancing, a much more robust testing regime, I'm glad Governor Evers has made that a top priority here in the state, working with our private labs and some of our biotech companies who have done a great job stepping up uh, to help out in that fashion. But it all starts with testing. We've got to know where the virus is, even the asymptomatic carriers who can infect more vulnerable people in our population. And we're not doing that uh, yet. And so that's a crucial element uh, that we're learning from other regions that have been more successful and what we need to accomplish right here in Wisconsin. Thank you, Congressman. And certainly uh, we are blessed with the medical and scientific resources we have here from, from Gunderson, Theta Care to the UW. Um, I know we have, like, we have uh, quite a few questions here, so let's go right to them, Michelle. Hi, Congressman. We have a few questions here. Some of these you've touched upon, but if we could just go back through. What do you think the next round of stimulus money will include? And are counties and other local governments viewed as a high priority? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Again, thanks so much for the work that you've been doing. Uh, uh, this really has been a, a team effort here in the state. I've been so impressed with the type of collaboration and coordination I'm seeing at the state and local level. Again, everyone realizing that we're in it together and we're gonna have to deal with this uh, together too. Uh, this next negotiation taking place is we're watching very closely with the P3 program, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, as far as the increased demand and if those funds need to be replenished. We gotta look at some of the timeline now, dates that are gonna start expiring. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, for instance, expires the middle of June. A lot of the business relief programs were short term in duration, trying to find out whether those dates need to be extended out a little bit further. There was also an extension of unemployment benefits, an additional 13 weeks, plus an additional $600 per week on top of what the state was already offering. We're trying to determine what the appropriate amount and time period for all of that would be. And then the aid to state and local governments, that's one of the bigger contentious points in negotiations right now. Uh, clearly, bankruptcy is not an option at the state or county or municipal level. Uh, the municipal bond market would collapse uh, virtually overnight uh, if we resorted to that. And so those discussions are taking place. I'm not sure where they're ultimately gonna land, but hopefully it'll be included in the package. And then further assistance to our healthcare providers. There's gonna be major healthcare infrastructure repair coming out of all this. But in the meantime, we're still hearing needs for more testing uh, from swabs to the reagents that are necessary to get accurate test results back and more PPEs you know, for our frontline healthcare workers and developing that supply chain in order to uh, make sure the distribution gets out there. To me, it makes absolutely no sense that we have 50 governors out there in the private marketplace outbidding each other and competing against each other and only driving up the price of materials that they're trying to 
bring in-state or buy in-state. Uh, we should be addressing this on a more national coordinated strategic level, uh, but that's not happening yet. And so it is virtually every governor, every state to themselves, uh, which I think complicates our ability to really counteract this virus in a, in a meaningful fashion. Congressman, do you think there are some things that should be in the next stimulus package that may not have been discussed yet or you feel are not being considered or have enough weight as they should? Yeah, you know, I've uh, just been on the phone with uh, our school superintendents, teachers, our chancellors throughout the state. Uh, just about half an hour ago, I was on with technical school presidents. Uh, education from K-12 to higher education is getting hammered right now too. Uh, you know, great compliments to them on the distance learning programs that are able to put in place literally within 24 hours. That's not easy, it increases more stress, but obviously, especially for our higher ed institutions, their revenue and bottom line has taken a huge hit. Now, during the first CARES package, we did appropriate 31 billion for education writ large, half of that for K-12, another half for higher ed. There were some restrictions on it. Half of the higher ed education had to go to direct assistance to families. So not a lot of flexibility for our higher ed institutions. So I'm hoping that in the next round, we're gonna be able to again address shortfalls, increase flexibility on the use of these funds, but also recognizing that a lot of the campuses in Wisconsin are looking at a 20, 25% enrollment decline for summer courses and going into the fall. And that's going to put some unique budgetary pressures uh, moving forward and maintaining a quality healthcare system and, quite frankly, a, a good job training program when we need it now more than ever in recovering from this, uh, this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then you couple on top of that the huge hit that state and local budgets are taking uh, when so much of the state budget is dedicated to education expenses. It's going to be very difficult moving forward for the states to be able to do this on their own. Uh, especially given their constitutional uh, uh, responsibilities. So I'm hoping that in this next round, there'll be a recognition of more assistance and aid to education, but uh, especially higher education institutions that we have around the state. We have a question here. Um, are you seeing some industries being hit harder than others here in Wisconsin? Do you, you know, what is the path forward on that? And that's a big question, but you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, clearly any of those businesses that require closer worker uh, contact is going to be impacted. We're looking at the meatpacking plants, for instance, in Green Bay and in other parts of our country having to be shut down. I've got a couple major manufacturers down in Grant County that had a huge flare up of the virus with their workforce right now. National Guard came in to implement uh, immediate testing in those communities. We're still keeping a close eye on the nursing homes, the most vulnerable population. Got a nursing home right now in my congressional district where the virus has established a stronghold, which is panicking everyone, uh, not least of which the residents are there. And again, my heart goes out to our family farmers right now. Uh, as a representative of one of the larger agriculture producing districts in the entire nation, our family farmers are getting hammered now more than ever. Uh, and this was occurring even before the virus. Uh, we've had four years now, really low commodity prices with record family farm bankruptcies the last two years. That's continued obviously now into this year. And that's why a couple of weeks ago, I announced a five point family farm rescue plan that I'm working with Secretary Purdue, uh, the USDA secretary on, on certain authorities and resources that he has available now that we need to get out the door immediately as far as assistance to family farms. Production agriculture is still a huge industry here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we've built up that infrastructure for many, many decades. I hate to see that collapse overnight and uh, the human fallout that would occur, occur as a consequence. Congressman, a follow-up to that. Um, you know, we have a more uh, traditional industry profile. You know, you had mentioned agriculture, but of course, uh, my neck of the woods and around the state manufacturing. And we're finding now more than ever, these are by definition and essential services that maybe folks would have taken for granted um, elsewhere around the country and also the world. What kind of opportunities do you see uh, in these industries and then by extension, us as local officials and champions of these various in industries, what kind of future do you see going forward if there are specific 
uh, strategies that we can capitalize on this. As uh, one of your former colleagues, uh, Rahm Emanuel, famously said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Yeah, great question, Tom. Uh, the new normal as we move forward is not going to look like the old normal uh, of the past. There's going to have to be major adjustments made within the workforce, within our communities, with our daily life, with tourism. I'm glad Secretary Meaty was touching upon that just a moment ago. Tourism is still a huge part of our state's economy. We're entering peak tourism season now at the spring and summer months uh, that are at our doorstep. And adjustments are going to have to be made there too as far as infectious disease control and protocols that are going to have to be implemented if we have any hope of trying to salvage the upcoming season. And that's going to happen too on the work on, uh, in the workplace, on the factory floor. I'm so proud that GE Healthcare, for instance, stepped up right away in their production mm -hmm. capability and ventilators that they've been able to crank up in a very short period of time. The fact that Exact Sciences in Madison is helping with testing right now. Uh, the gold standard is ultimately a no-cost test kit in our homes that we can do with a saliva test to send in and within 24 hours getting a test result back or even better being able to see the results within our own living rooms or our own bathrooms like a pregnancy test that's the type of testing regime we're ultimately going to need to develop in order to loosen up the restrictions for more economic activity until a vaccine is developed that clearly is the long-term answer and in the first legislative package that we passed out of Congress, uh, middle of March, uh, there was a significant amount of funding for vaccine development, for expedited clinical trials, and then for a global distribution network once mm -hmm. the vaccine is mm -hmm. developed. We're going to need to get that out uh, or it's ultimately not going to have the desired effect in the period of time that we want it. So, I, I, you know, I, it was interesting, Tom, uh, that during my conversation with the tech school presidents, that they emphasized with me their unique role with the programs that they already have established when it comes to the essential workforce that, that we currently have and how they can meet that labor demand right now without having to reinvent themselves. So fortunately, again, when you look at Wisconsin, we have been doing a lot of things well in the past that's gonna serve us very well currently and as we move forward uh, in dealing with this pandemic. All right, thank you, Congressman. Uh, if there are no other questions from the floor, I don't see anything on our chat. Um, okay, so great, that well, hey, thanks, thanks again, everyone, and, and keep up the great work and let's maintain these lines of communication. So to you and, and to all your loved ones, stay safe and stay healthy and uh, uh, we're gonna be okay. I'm confident given what I'm seeing taking place throughout the state. Uh, we're just being asked to do a lot of uncomfortable things right now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Congressman. Appreciate it. Be safe yourself. Okay. All right. We are moving on to uh, Andy Phillips with a quick update, I think specifically on Act 185 and other legal matters. Thank you, Tom. Um, pleasure seeing everybody or hearing everybody again today. Wanted to give an update on Act 185. I'm starting to feel like a broken record here talking about this every week. Um, but the Act 185, it, despite best efforts through the Counties Association, League of Wisconsin Municipalities, there are still some misconceptions about what, what Act 185 does. And so I wanna make clear that it does require a cooperative effort between the county and the underlying taxing districts, those being the cities, villages, and towns. So it requires all of us to act in concert with one another in terms of authorizing the delay in the installment payments that are otherwise due uh, at the end of May, June, and July. Uh, waiving interest and penalties on those installment payments uh, so that they become due on October 1st. Now, one thing that as an association we've been working diligently on is trying to assess and address the cash flow issues that result from that delay in the installment payments. Um, obviously, counties um, are required statutorily right now to settle with the underlying taxing jurisdictions, primarily uh, school districts, cities, villages, towns, tech college districts, um, on August 20th. Under Act 185, if the installment date is extended, then that settlement becomes a settlement based upon money that's actually received by July 31st. And so it's not a full settlement. That creates a tax flow, or excuse me, a cash flow issue, primarily for school districts who are counting on that money on August 20th in order to meet their cash flow needs and begin the next school year. Um, the second set of 
cash flow issues happens on September 20th when counties are required to settle in full on their tax roll. And they have to settle in full uh, two weeks prior to the, uh, the due date for the next installment payment, that being October 1st. And so given that confluence of settlement and cash flow issues, the counties association is working on a program for counties to address those cash flow issues and will continue in that effort. But what we as a counties association, I'm sure the league and the school districts would all agree is let's all have a cooperative discussion about those cash flow needs so that we can all understand the challenges and the burdens that this Act 185 implementation may present so that people can make informed decisions about borrowing, about capacity under the general fund, about making sure that we can pay bills when they become due, that's going to be critical. Um, the one thing that we also know as a result of this is that these cash flow issues are not an isolated issue. We have declined sales tax revenues. We probably are going to see a decline in property tax revenues. So that just exacerbates the cash flow issues that we've just discussed. So again, understand what Act 185 does, act in cooperation with one another, and let's collaborate on some of these issues so that we can come up with the best solution for everybody from a cash flow perspective. The second thing, and, and this is a topic that I'm sure is on everybody's mind, and it's something that we are paying attention to very closely, and that is oral arguments on the Supreme Court case happened yesterday afternoon, and that's the case where the Wisconsin legislature essentially sued uh, the administration saying the emergency orders uh, that are issued, safer at home as they're called, exceeded the secretary's and the governor's statutory authority to issue those orders. We don't know where the Supreme Court is going to land on this issue. We don't know when the Supreme Court is going to land on this issue. And so there are all sorts of questions about what happens if. And unfortunately, trying to crawl down that rabbit hole of what happens if is just going to lead to a mental exercise that gives me and others a headache. And so as a counties association, we are working on an analysis of the what happens if, so that when it does happen, we are able to get information out because the biggest fear, of course, is just mass chaos. We have state orders contradicting local orders, contradicting what law enforcement thinks the orders uh, should say, uh, contradictory to what other administrations think should be enforced. That's just chaos. We, we think as an association, there ought to be a good coordinated response understanding that there is some local control here as it relates to enforcement and relates to implementation of the orders, but at least we should have a firm understanding statewide of what is or is not going to be the law. And so we're going to work diligently, um, and I assume we're going to collaborate with our, with our municipal partners on this as well, but primarily we're talking about a county issue here given the health officers and, and the state orders. So we're going to get information out uh, as it relates to implementation of what it, whatever it is the Supreme Court may order or may not order. We'll get information out on that as soon as we can after the Supreme Court uh, makes up its mind. So with that, Tom, I'll turn it back to you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, or if there are other questions, happy to address those as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if there are any questions. Uh, before I go to Michelle, though, I guess I'm going to push back on the answer you gave to a question that that is on our mind, which is, you've got a good nose for these things. If you had a guess, when do you think uh, they're going to come down? Um, with a ruling and then any sense of what we can be expecting? Well, I will tell you that here, here's my gut, is that these things always come at the most inconvenient time for me. And so <laughs> my plan is to be sitting in a blind turkey hunting on Friday morning and I can guarantee you that's when the decision will come down. So if I had to guess, I'd say Friday based upon my own personal experience, but beyond my personal experience and my professional opinion, I think that we're probably looking at a Friday decision or thereabouts, probably Friday afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Any questions on the floor? We do have a, we do have a call, uh, question here from Mark Harris. Are counties contemplating their own stay-at-home orders if the court strikes down the state order? I think that's a great question, Mark. Um, and I, I think that there are plenty of counties that are contemplating that. I think Dane County has already issued an order to that effect, if I'm not mistaken. I personally have received several phone calls from, from county officials saying, do we have the authority to issue our own order? And to the extent we do, what is the 
breadth of that order, the enforceability of that order? Can we go beyond what the current emergency orders say, all of those types of things? Um, the one thing I will tell you is that, again, it's very difficult to try to handicap this because, as you might remember, in all of the emergency orders to date, there has been the provision at the end that says any local order in conflict with this emergency order is superseded. So are we going to have a replacement order that follows on the Supreme Court decision? Are we going to have nothing? Are we going to have an executive order as opposed to an emergency order? Remember, the legislature did not extend by joint resolution Executive Order 72, which declared the public health emergency. So we have all sorts of questions and issues that are out there. I will, I will say it this, because this has been, been a very long-winded way of answering Mark's question, and that is, is that local health officials do have authority independent of the DHS secretary, the governor, and the legislature. The extent of that independence is going to depend upon the circumstances surrounding what it is that that local health official wants to order. But you don't think, as, as a follow-up to that, but you don't think as part of the ruling, it's going to speak um, to those uh, particular powers at the local level, because there are exam I mean, there are instances when a court makes a ruling that goes beyond um, what the plaintiffs or the petitioners are asking for. Yeah, and if you look at what the plaintiffs or petitioners are asking for, they have said to the court, delay your implementation by a week to give everybody an opportunity to assess, evaluate, and come up with a replacement. Because to the extent you think that this emergency order isn't good, there needs to be something in place. The court, of course, is free to order what it wants to order. And so there is a possibility the court comes out on Friday afternoon and says, you know what, no emergency orders, we're done. Um, these all exceeded the authority of the DHS secretary, the governor, what have you, and so we're going to have no orders in place. I think that would be chaotic, but that's, that's a potential. At that point, I think that we have to think about what is the coordinated response going to be at the local level. As county health officials, are we going to issue orders to replace essentially what Emergency Order 28 did or what Executive Order 72 did and, and so on and so forth. And so Again, we're crawling down that rabbit hole of what ifs, but I think you can see that there are a lot of moving parts and pieces and we ought to start thinking about these issues so that we're prepared in the eventuality that we need to take action swiftly in order to preserve public health, safety and welfare. Thank you. Michelle, any other questions? No, I think that concludes it on our end. Um, Mr. Nelson, if I could just add in that we'd gotten a question from Nicholas Trimner um, regarding whether or not this would be, uh, this entire call today would be recorded. Um, Anne Murray is recording it and we will have it up on our YouTube channel um, and we will share it as well in our daily update that we send out at the end of each day as the daily update title indicates. So that's all I have, Andy. Thanks again for your time. As always, your expertise is incredibly um, appreciated here and your tremendous resource for all of us. Thank you. Thanks again, Andy. So that's going to wrap it up today. We're going to have uh, for next week, um, as, as we did for this week, please, if you have any suggestions or recommendations for an, any guests to submit that to uh, Michelle or Anne, Anne Marie, and I think at least for the county execs administrators, you have my, my email address, so please share it. Um, but thanks again. I think this was a really good meeting, good questions, uh, great conversations. So I hope it was beneficial to everyone. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.